Welcome back. Today we're getting into myasthenia gravis, focusing on treatment strategies that you, as healthcare providers, can really use. Okay, so myasthenia gravis, it's, um, it's a chronic autoimmune condition, a neuromuscular disorder. The main things you see are muscle weakness that fluctuates and uh, fatigability. It happens because the immune system mistakenly makes autoantibodies. These attack the neuromuscular junction. Usually, it's the acetylcholine receptor, the ACHR, that gets targeted. And that messes up the communication between nerve and muscle. Right. That connection is key. So thinking about that, when a patient first presents, what's the um, the initial step for managing their symptoms? Where do you start? Well, for just managing the symptoms day to day, the cornerstone treatment is... Uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. And the one we use most often is pyridostamine. Pyridostinemia. Okay. How exactly does that work? And, you know, what do providers need to keep in mind when they're prescribing it? What are the practical points? So pyridostigmine basically stops the enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, yeah. from breaking down acetylcholine in that space, the neuromuscular junction. By doing that, you get more acetylcholine available, and that helps improve muscle strength. It's usually taken by mouth. Dosing is very specific to the patient. It really has to be individualized. It starts working pretty fast, usually within about 30 minutes. But the effects only last maybe three to four hours. Oh, only three to four hours. That sounds like it could cause some real ups and downs for patients. Exactly. That short duration is a challenge. Patients often notice symptoms returning before the next dose. We call it the wear-off effect. So how do you manage that? And what about side effects? Well, timing is important. We often advise patients to take it, say, 30 to 60 minutes before meals to help with swallowing or before activities where they need more strength. As for side effects, they're typically cholinergic. Think um, gastrointestinal issues mainly, diarrhea, stomach cramps, maybe more salivation. Usually we can manage these by tweaking the dose. Sometimes we might add something temporary for diarrhea, but it's really important to remember this drug helps symptoms but it doesn't change the autoimmune attack itself. Right. It's symptom management, not disease modification. Makes yeah. sense. So that brings us to the next point. Dealing with that underlying autoimmune process for the long haul, what's the approach there? Yes, exactly. For long-term management, we rely on immunosuppressive agents. That's really the backbone. Often the first choice is corticosteroids like prednisone. They're powerful anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive drugs. They work relatively quickly. Prednisone. Okay. But powerful drugs often come with uh, significant side effects, right? How do you handle prednisone therapy practically? The dosing, managing those downsides. You're absolutely right. Prednisone needs careful handling. Therapy usually starts with a moderate to high dose, maybe 60 milligrams a day or one milligram per kilogram per day, something like that to get symptoms under control quickly. Once we see improvement, often within a few weeks, we start a very, very gradual taper. This can take months. The goal is to find the lowest possible dose that still controls the symptoms, maybe like 5 or 10 milligrams every other day. We have to be really careful with that taper to avoid flare-ups. And yes, the side effects. We need to watch for things like weight gain, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, bone thinning osteoporosis, and a higher risk of infections. That sounds like a lot to monitor. It is. Proactive steps are key. Things like calcium and vitamin D supplements right from the start are standard. We monitor bone density with DEXA scans, blood pressure checks, blood sugar monitoring. It's ongoing. We really have to think about the patient's overall health, not just the MG. Okay, given all those potential long-term issues with steroids, what are the main options for uh, sparing steroids, reducing that reliance? Good question. Steroid sparing agents are vital. Common ones include azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, or sometimes cyclosporine. Azathioprine is probably the most commonly used historically. It works by slowing down the production of lymphocytes, those immune cells. But the big thing with azathioprine, and you have to tell patients this up front, is that it's slow, really slow. It can take um, maybe 6 to 12 months to see the full clinical benefit. Wow, 6 to 12 months. That's a long time to wait. How do you bridge that gap? It is a long wait. Yeah. So we usually start azathioprine while the patient is still on prednisone. The prednisone provides the control initially. Then, as the azathioprine starts to hopefully kick in, we can gradually taper the prednisone further. And with azathioprine, you absolutely need regular monitoring. Blood counts are crucial checking for bone marrow suppression, especially early on. And liver function tests, too, for potential liver toxicity. So, yes, it takes patients from everyone and very diligent monitoring. Okay, that covers the sort of day-to-day -day and longer-term management. What about acute exacerbations or even a myasthenic crisis? Yes, acute exacerbations need quick action. And a myasthenic crisis, that's when the weakness affects the respiratory muscles causing breathing failure. Oh. Well, that's a true medical emergency. 
It requires immediate hospitalization, often intensive care, for breathing support. So in those critical situations, what are the go-to treatments for rapid improvement? For those severe flare-ups or a crisis, the mainstays are plasmapheresis, sometimes called plasma exchange, or PLEX, and intravenous immunoglobulin, IVVEX. Both work relatively quickly to reduce the harmful autoantibodies circulating in the blood. The benefit is usually temporary, though. Okay, let's take plasmapheresis first. Can you explain what that involves? Sure. Plasmapheresis is a procedure where we take the patient's blood out, separate the plasma, which has the autoantibodies, and then return the blood cells to the patient mixed with a replacement fluid, usually albumin. It's done over several sessions, maybe five to seven treatments spread over 10 to 14 days. It's very effective, but it's invasive. You need good venous access, often a central line, and there could be risks like drops in blood pressure during the procedure or issues with electrolytes, especially calcium. So it needs close monitoring. Right. And how does IV compare to that? IV is different. It's an infusion of pooled immunoglobulin G from thousands of healthy donors. We don't know the exact mechanism perfectly, but it seems to modulate the immune system in various ways, maybe blocking receptors, neutralizing antibodies, things like that. Mm. It's given as an IV infusion, usually over two to five days. Generally, IV is less invasive than plasmapheresis and often has fewer serious side effects. What kind of side effects are common with IV? Mostly milder things like headache, fever, chills, infusion-related reactions. We can often manage those by slowing down the infusion. There are rare but serious risks, like kidney problems or blood clots, so we still need to monitor patients, check kidney function, make sure they're hydrated. Both PLEX and IV are often used as a bridge, you know, to stabilize a patient before longer-term treatments start working or maybe before surgery, like a thymectomy. That makes sense. You mentioned thymectomy. Let's talk about that surgical option. What role does the thymus gland play in myasthenia gravis? Ah, the thymus. It's a gland in the chest that's central to the immune system's development. In many MG patients, especially those with antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor, the thymus seems to be, well, misbehaving. It appears to be involved in triggering or perpetuating the autoimmune attack. Right. Some patients even have a tumor in the thymus called a thymoma. So a thymectomy is a surgical removal of the thymus gland. And what does the evidence show? Does removing the thymus actually help? Yes, for the right patients, it definitely does. We have good evidence now from randomized controlled trials particularly for patients with generalized MG who have those anti-ACHR antibodies but don't have a thymoma, thymectomy can improve clinical outcomes. It can lead to less need for immunosuppressant drugs, fewer exacerbations, and sometimes even remission. The benefit seems greatest when it's done relatively early in the disease, maybe within the first few years. And if a patient does have a thymoma, then thymectomy is generally recommended regardless because of the tumor itself. Has the surgery itself changed much over the years? Oh, absolutely. We've moved towards much less invasive techniques. Things like video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, VATS. Instead of a big incision through the breastbone, it's done with small incisions and a camera. This usually means less pain, shorter hospital stays, quicker recovery. But patient selection is still really important. It's a decision made by a team, the neurologist, the thoracic surgeon, the anesthesiologist working together. And it's important for patients to understand the benefit isn't always immediate. It can take months, even years, to see the full effect on the immune system after the surgery. Right. Managing those expectations is key. Okay, looking forward now, the research landscape is always changing. Are there newer emerging therapies showing promise, especially for tougher cases? Yes. This is a very exciting area. We're seeing new targeted therapies coming through, which is great for patients who don't respond well to the standard treatments or who can't tolerate them. These newer drugs go after specific parts of the immune pathway involved in MG. Like complement inhibitors. Tell us about those. All right. So in MG, when antibodies bind at the neuromuscular junction, they can trigger something called the complement cascade, which causes direct damage. Complement inhibitors, like uh, eculizumab, block this cascade. Eculizumab targets a specific protein, C5, preventing the final damaging steps. This can lead to significant improvements in muscle strength. It's approved for refractory generalized MG with anti-ACHR antibodies. One really important point for providers. Patients need to be vaccinated against meningococcal disease before starting because blocking complement increases the risk of those specific infections. It's usually given as an IV infusion every couple of weeks. Okay, and what about a different approach, the neonatal FSC receptor antagonists? Yes, the FCRN antagonists. f gertigimod is an example. These work differently. They target the neonatal FC receptor, FCRN. 
This receptor normally helps recycle IgG antibodies, including the harmful autoantibodies in Mg, keeping them in circulation longer. Right. By blocking FCRN, these drugs cause IgG antibodies to be broken down and removed from the body faster, so you get lower levels of the pathogenic autoantibodies. Clinical trials have shown they work well, leading to rapid improvements, and they seem to have a pretty good safety profile so far, usually mild side effects like headache. They're also given by infusion, often in cycles. These newer targeted therapies, they really represent a shift towards more uh, personalized medicine in myasthenia gravis. We can start tailoring treatments more specifically. That's really encouraging to hear. So bringing it all together, it sounds like effective management is really about a tailored, comprehensive approach. Exactly. It's about finding that right balance for each individual patient, managing their symptoms effectively day to day, while also using the right immunomodulatory strategy to control the underlying disease process long term. And for you, the healthcare providers listening, that means ongoing assessment is vital. Regularly checking how the patient is doing, how they're responding to treatment, watching for side effects, and adjusting the plan as needed. And remember that collaborative approach, working with neurologists, surgeons, therapists, educating the patient, it's all part of providing the best care. Think about how applying this knowledge impacts their daily lives. 